coming up on short notice, everyone. Um, appreciate that it was late notice today and, uh, and not ideal given the traffic and the timing, but um, we do appreciate you coming along with that short notice um, this afternoon. Uh, Cameron Klein is the ARU chairman and Bill Pulver is the CEO of the ARU. Um, we've obviously just made an announcement in the last um, hour or so and Cameron and Bill are going to address that announcement. Um, and I'll hand over now to Cameron to kick things off. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll make an opening statement, and then uh, Bill will make some comments, then we're happy to, to open it to questions. Uh, today I have the regrettable duty of informing you that the ARU Board has made the decision to discontinue the Western Force Super Rugby licence, meaning they will no longer participate in Super Rugby from the 2018 season. This was an incredibly tough decision, the one that had to be made for the long-term sustainability of our game. Before I go on, there are a number of people within the Western Force organisation who are affected by this outcome. The ARU is committed to supporting those people through this difficult, these difficult circumstances and will provide in individual assistance to all players and staff. We, we will be honouring all player contracts in accordance with terms which have been agreed by RUPA and will assist all Western Force players in preparing for their next phase. Just as importantly, there are passionate rugby fans in Western Australia who are hurting today. To those fans, we are deeply sorry to deliver this news and thank you for your unwavering support of your team over the past 11 years. We accept that today's news will be met with anger and resentment and we sympathise with those fans. This has been a complex process to reduce Australia's Super Rugby representation to four teams, as agreed by Sanzar following its review of the competition. It was clearly not our intention for this to play out over such a lengthy period. However, there have been factors outside the AU's control that have prevented us from completing the process. Our decision to exit the Western Force has been guided primarily by financial outcomes. As we have reinforced throughout the process, there are commercial realities which are linked to declining on-field performance across our Super Rugby teams, which has put Australian rugby in a position where it can no longer sustain five teams. Furthermore, the significant unbudgeted support, fund, support funding that has been provided to Super Rugby teams over the past five years has greatly affected our capacity to invest in community rugby. We are regretful that this situation has cast a pall over the Super Rugby season and has consumed so much of the public commentary on the game in 2017. And for this, we apologise to all rugby fans. The decision to exit the Western Force from Super Rugby is not a decision to abandon the game in Western Australia. Western Australia will remain important, retain an important place in Australian rugby and the ARU will continue to support youth development programs and the community game in the West. Most importantly, there will be a clear pathway for young Western Australian rugby players to reach the highest level and represent the Wallabies. I'd like now to hand over to Bill before we open the floor to questions. Firstly, I'd like to repeat Cameron's apology to all rugby fans for what has been an extreme, extremely challenging period of our game. I'd also like to acknowledge Matt Hodgson and his Western Force team, Mark Sindabry and his executive team, and Tony Howarth and his board. These are all good people and this is a devastating outcome for them and I feel for them. Nobody really wanted to lose a team from this competition, but this is clearly the best outcome for the future of Australian rugby. My sense is that we now need a period of renewal in Australian rugby, which is why I've told the board that I will step aside as CEO once they have found a replacement. Our strategic challenge in Australian rugby boils down to two main objectives. The first is to grow the number of young boys and girls playing the game. And I'm pleased to say this decision today will support expanded investment in community rugby and we can now beginning, begin working with the state unions on some exciting plans for the community side of the game next year. Our second main objective is to win more games at the highest level and I'm also pleased to report that our discussions with state unions about greater high performance collaboration are developing well. Thank you and we're now happy to take any questions. Uh, because it was, there were legal proceedings commenced uh, after we made the announcement, um, so it's obviously when, when you go down that path, it takes a long time. Cameron, you said those legal proceedings were out of your control, but how did it get to a point where legal proceedings were an option? Um, and you didn't consider that in the decision when you made it? Well, we did consider it. As I said, the, uh, when there was speculation uh, in the period before uh, April we made the announcement, uh, the uh, franchises had communicated to us that if there was a decision made by the board 
to reduce the number of teams that they would like us to reduce, make that decision and announce it very quickly. Uh, and we, we were comfortable with that. We're obviously we're comfortable with our ability to uh, look at exiting a team. Obviously, when we made the decision, uh, some franchises actually changed their view, which they're entitled to, and commenced legal proceedings. So, you know, it's it's a difficult process. Um, but we were obviously acting on the basis that you know that's what teams had expressed. Um, obviously, when the actual decision was made, there was a view that they would like to make a legal challenge. That that was you know a factor. It's never going to be easy to go from five to four. Um, but we were obviously that prior to making the decision, we we're acting on the basis that teams wanted the decision made quickly. Are you prepared for this to drag out now? The force have said that they're prepared to go to the Supreme Court. I mean, what's that process looking like? Well, I haven't, I, I, I haven't heard what their next steps are. I mean, I, you have to to discuss when we obviously we've made our announcement today. Well, they've said they're going to look at the Supreme Court action in New South Wales. It's obviously, you prepared for this. This is going that way. Well, I, I haven't, I haven't seen. What, they, what, what process they've announced. We've obviously made a decision here today. If, if they go down that process, we'll deal with that when, when, it, when it comes. This, this is for both, but the, the RUPA is just put a statement saying this is the darkest day in Australian rugby. Would you both agree with that statement? Well, look, it's not, it's not a very you know, pleasant situation, but you know, we, we have to confront reality here. Uh, the, our teams have declined in performance. Our performance has declined from when we went from three teams to four teams and decline went to five teams. It is, I know it's easy to say, well, people haven't turned up to games uh, because of uncertainty. People haven't turned up to games because the teams don't win. And we just don't, we, and there's a direct correlation to revenue. It's not a pleasant situation. We have consulted widely before the process, during the process. You'll recall that uh, an, an EGM was held uh, and the members voted in support. They had an opportunity, and again, after you know, they voted in support of four teams. So you know, we're acting in line with with what the members and stakeholders want. It's not going to be an easy process, but you know, what will get revenue flowing back into the game is our teams winning. There is more chance of our teams winning with four teams. That's the reality. Yeah. Phil, Phil, just clarifying, you, you said you'll step aside as CEO, CEO and a replacement as founder. How long do you expect that process to take? Is it purely this issue that is kind of yeah, look, at, I, I would describe this year as a pretty tough year for rugby. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with the issue of dropping a super rugby team, and that, that has been a harrowing process. So my sense is that it's a good time for renewal. I'm coming up towards the end of my five-year term, um, and I think we want a, a clean slate, right? The, the next generation of rugby in this country, I think, will be served with a new head. So I think it's the right time. Yeah, look, I, I have enormous sympathy for all the people in WA, and I mentioned that in my prepared remarks. Um, you know, Mark Cinderbury's a great CEO. He's got a great team of people. And Matt Hodgson's been a great captain. Tony House, a really good chair of the board. Um, they're great people, and I feel very sorry for them. Uh, simply, this is the right decision for Australian rugby. We need to get the balance right between the amount of money we invest in the professional game and the community game, and this is going to help. Rugby existed in WA before the Western Force were there, and it will exist in WA after the Western Force are gone. There are still a lot of opportunities for community development of the game, the elite development of the game. Uh, we'll still have the NRTC team. So, look, in short, I'm, I'm very, very sorry for all the people affected by this in WA, but it is the right decision for Australian rugby. Phil, this was an easy decision, and you, know, you were able to cut a team early, you know, 123 <coughs> days, and that there's you know, a degree of... Um uncertainty for so long, do you think you would have resigned then, I mean, or, or is it only because of this uncertainty? That... Um, look, I think, uh, you know, sport's a difficult business, um, and we've had a really difficult year. This Certainly the, the issues surrounding Super Rugby has galvanised my thought on my tenure at the game. You know, it's been a, it's been a difficult year, um, and I think that just means it's the right time for a change. A period of renewal, a fresh set of eyes and ears coming into this game, um, in order to take us on to the next generation of it. So I think it's the right time. Are you wanted that there'll be a perception that rugby is becoming more of an East Coast game with no actual presence? I mean, I know they say there's an NRC team still on the West Coast, yeah. there, but there will be the perception that it is kind of East Coast biased in terms of the super rugby scene. Yeah, look, I understand that, but you've still got all the development pathways through all the boys' and girls' level of the game.
right? So rugby developed very successfully in WA before the Western Force, and I think it will, will do... I'm, I, I'm not denying that this will have an impact. It will. Um, but we will do our utmost in forming the right relationships going forward to continue the development in, in West Australia and to make sure that all the really high potential young boys and girls over there get their chance to realise their dream and play for their country. Is it now, in terms of those players who are off contract, is it now open to in terms of the, the other Australian Super Rugby teams? signing players or are there any kind of restrictions? Or no, so, so basically we'll start that exercise on Monday um, in discussion with all of the contract. All the contracted players will have their contracts honoured. Um, hopefully most of them will actually find a new super, super rugby team. If they don't, we will allow them to have an early release. If they don't want an early release, we will still honour their contracts. Yeah, look, at the end of the day, we did an exhaustive analysis, a massive spreadsheet on all the variables that went into this decision. Um, and, and, you know, some of them community-based, some of them high-performance-based, and, and frankly, um, at the end of the day, the best decision for Australian rugby was to remove the Western Force. Financially, it made the most sense, and from a high-performance perspective, it made the most sense. Yeah, we, saw, we saw this year after you announced that the Force galvanised, they had huge crowd support, they Rebels didn't seem to have that level of support. Did the last uh, four months play any part at all? Um, well, well, I was just—I think the the force have run a, a very um, enthusiastic and public campaign. I think that it, it would be wrong to assume that there wasn't that level of enthusiasm in Melbourne. Uh, there was. Um, uh, there, you can point to before, the crowd numbers across all Super Rugby franchises were actually unsatisfactory. So even teams that were not under threat. So, and even in, in both Victoria and Melbourne, sorry, in Victoria and Perth, the crowds were not great. They weren't great at the Waratahs and the Brumbies and the Reds either, but they haven't been great anywhere because it, it's got nothing to do with uncertainty. It's got to do with team performance. The, there has been a lot of public support and genuine financial support from people in Melbourne uh, that have come out. And whilst we do... Uh, appreciate people like Andrew getting involved. Um, it came very late in the piece. I mean, part of the issue is the force were, were virtually bankrupt and, and had to be bailed out. This was announced in April. His involvement's come obviously quite, quite late in the piece. But even having said that, we factored in, uh, in the interest of, of fairness, we factored in the assumption that the Own the Force campaign would reach its limit, although it hasn't. We factored that in and there was still a better financial, a significantly better financial outcome from the support coming out of Melbourne. What, what if any difference did the change of ownership to the Rebels to the BRU make? Well, I mean, that, that was, that's a decision between the, the Rebels and the BRU. I mean, we, we just, and we have to go through a process of approving that, but, um, you know, there, there, ha, there has been some very significant and long-standing rugby people with genuine deep connections to the community game in Victoria who have stepped forward and made genuine financial commitments uh, to the Rebels. So even, even factoring in uh, that the force, which they have not done, but that they did reach their full thing, and bear in mind it's been going, as, as people point out, for an extended period of time and it's not fully subscribed, but we took the assumption it would be on the... On the Promise it still was a better financial outcome in Melbourne by a significant way. Rugby WA statements as they'll continue to fight. Are you both 100% certain this is the final decision? It's the final decision from our perspective. I mean, we, we, we can't, you know, uh, we can't control, um, you know, processes that go from here. Uh, we have wanted to bring this to a close, you know, but we, but we have not been able to do that for a variety of, of constraints that have been placed on us. Uh, we're now in a position where we can act and, and we'll continue down that process. If there are other legal avenues, that, that's something for the force to discuss and consider. Cameron Bill says moving on for a fresh set of ideas. There's some wounded relationships in Australian rugby clubs. Do you feel like you're all there to continue to lead or do you review your position? Well, I, uh, we made the decision uh, to go to four teams. Uh, that was made ahead of the AGM this year. I was up for election at the AGM, was re-elected. We then had an EGM where the members uh, voted in support of 14. So we're actually we're implementing a policy, as painful as it is, that the members voted in support of. So, but having said that, um, you know the the members are free at any time to call the process and, and review that. But I think having been through 
you know, two, uh, two reviews with the members in the space of four months and, and being supportive of both of those in the direction we're taking, uh, I'm comfortable, but the members, of course, are free to change their view at any point in time. If the, um, if the SANZO relationship was we know it and Super Rugby changes in the future, uh, is there the potential for Western Australia to regain a professional franchise down the track? Have you discussed that? I think, look, what, what's, what's very important here is that there are, whilst this is, you know, been a very complex and difficult process, we as a board are charged to have a look at the longer term strategic impacts of the game. It would be very damaging for the governing body in its future deliberations with any partners not to be in a position where it can't have some say in shaping participants in the competition. If, if, we, if there was a situation where, where other bodies around the world felt that Australia did not have the, the governing body did not have the ability to shape the competition, then that would be very damaging to Australian rugby going into future. You know, and I know that a lot of people talk about uh, you know, desires for better competition structures uh, that are more appealing and more engaging. Uh, us going to four teams gives us a significant chance of getting that delivered. Uh, staying at five teams would have virtually ended the prospect of us having better super rugby constructs going forward. Having said that, we don't know when we go beyond this broadcast agreement, but what has to be clear is that we need to look at the, the very clear correlation between performance and revenue. So just expanding the number of teams because you know it, 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 it sort of meets a, a, a metric to have more people in a competition or it suits a conference objective. If those teams don't perform, people don't go and watch the games and you have a revenue issue. So we, we haven't made any decisions with regard to what will happen in the next broadcast agreement. However, we'll be very mindful of saying that any any teams that go into that next broadcast from Australian perspective have to go in there with a very strong you know, uh, uh, view of winning. I mean, we have to be very uh, uh, careful that, that the Australian teams are performing so we retain some ability to have influence over those com you know, um, com conference structures in the future. If people don't think Australia is worthy of playing, because from a high performance perspective, we will not have the ability to influence what could be good outcomes for Australian rugby. So. As difficult as this is, this is, this is a significant step forward in positioning us to have a better super rugby structure in the, in the period going forward. So you're basically saying that uh, had these teams performed better, that there would have still been a chance of maintaining five teams, but the fact that we've had two or three teams down the bottom pile of the table didn't help. Well, we, we, we've, had, but we've had a sustained lack of performance going from three to four to five. Um, and, you know, the, as I said, the, the, it, it, I know it's... It, it's always easy for, you know, and it's more comfortable to find various excuses about, well, people haven't turned up because of uncertainty. Or, that's not the case. There's just such a clear correlation between teams playing well. Going to one of the reasons that club rugby, I mean, there's many reasons club rugby is going well, and there's obviously the, in, you know, in, in many states. Um, but one is, is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a low investment for people to go to a game. There's obviously an emotional connection to the club. When you go down, you stand there, you watch a game of football, you hope your team plays well. The standard of football is good, but at the end of the day, even if the team doesn't win, it's been, you know, $15 and a, and a beer and a pie on the sideline. Going to watch a super team is a big investment in time and money. You know, you've got to get there, you've got to get to the stadium, you've got to park, you've got to get public transport. Our sta some of our stadiums are not... <laughs> Not world class, so you make all that. You know, so you, you you want to be sure if you're going to make that investment that you're going to see. And this is this is not based on anecdote. This is based on extremely comprehensive surveys. I mean, the strategic plan is not something we cooked up. The strategic plan was based on input from 8,000 fans who took the time to tell us this, and and the fact that we're out there talking to them every weekend. You want to be sure that the team is going to play well and have a high prospect of winning before you make that significant investment. So you just, we just have to face reality. We, our teams are not winning um, uh, on a regular basis, um, and, and that is just keeping fans who are saying, who've got lots more entertainment options now, are saying, well, I'm not going to necessarily make that investment, and that just has a direct impact to revenue. Even, even notwithstanding the fact that we, we've made the decision to cut a team, we will still expect three, two or three of the teams to lose money next year. Now, hopefully we want to correct that over time as their performance improves, but, you know, we've put a lot of money into these teams over an extended period of time. If, if you make a choice, and I've said this repeatedly uh, to, to, you know, uh, rugby events that I've spoken at, and, you know, the, the directors of... I mean, I tallied up the other day, I think probably in terms of community rugby, the directors and Bill have probably spoken to more than 100 
different rugby groups over the last four months telling the, the story. But if you make a decision to continue to invest in Super Rugby, uh, you're maintain, you are making a conscious decision not to invest, not to invest somewhere else, and that, it's only a limited pot. So you, you know, if you and you know, you know, our Wallaroos were extraordinary yesterday, only just losing by two points. They deserve a lot more support. They're not getting the level of financial support they deserve. Uh, nor is community rugby, nor is schools rugby, and other things. So we, we're just saying, look, we need to reallocate some of the pie to those things. Now, if, if you're saying, and I know people, if you believe in five teams, I know you're going to be very If you believe in four teams, it's painful, but, we, you know, someone, someone's going to have to suffer. We looked at the mergers in close detail. They don't work. So one team had to suffer. But if you believe in five, you've got five teams, you've got to say, tell me the other part of rugby you'd like to suffer. That's the reality. Um, and we've made the decision that the, the investment in... This is not based on one season. This is based on multiple seasons of losses and poor performance. And we just feel that, that the, those areas of the game which are growing really strongly, uh, like women's, 15th and 7s, like community like schools, like Indigenous rugby, they deserve some of the pie. Cameron, that, that's the strategy you're talking about. Execution of the strategy is a different thing again. Just to clarify what you said, that teams, the teams agreed that, that a team should go, and then you were sort of surprised that the legal action came after that. Are you saying that, that you believe one team would just willingly die? Isn't that a little bit naive? No, no. I, look, it's, I can't... I can't get into some of the legal discussions, OK? So, no, I, don't, I didn't necessarily think, no, that a team would, would vote. Uh, all, at, at pub, I think all teams at one point or another, all five teams have said publicly they actually believe there should be four teams. I think they've all said that at various points in time. Um, and even in some of the, the high-profile sort of views expressed by the force recently, it was actually that they were a better prospect than the rebels should go. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's been a strong view. No, I didn't necessarily expect... Uh, that a team would, would volunteer to go, but we did not make the decision, we would not have committed to make the decision without a view that would be able to execute the decision. That's probably as much as I can say. Were you aware that the force had, a, had a, an alliance agreement with a clause in it that they believe they could stay in the culture between them? I, I'm not... That's, that's where we've been stuck on for the last month, is that agreement? Well, I'm, I, I, can't, I, guess I can't get into the... the, the the, the legal nature of it. But we made the decision, we would not have made the decision if we weren't confident that we were able, we were able to execute on the decision. If this does go to the Supreme Court, are you worry about the legal costs and how that might affect bottom line? Um, well, the reality is only, only if we lose. Costs follow, um, generally follow the winners is of, of legal proceedings. So obviously, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but uh, the, that will be the least of rugby's concerns <laughs> if we, you know, because we just can't maintain five. But we're, we're obviously, at this stage, we're, we're comfortable with the cost position. We assume just what's happened today that you prevail in the arbitration matter. I can't, I can't comment on the process. Did either of you speak to Andrew Forrest to inform him the decision and talk to him about this? Or? I, I, I spoke to uh, I, I spoke to Tony Howarth uh, and uh, Bill spoke to Mark Sindbury. Tony's the chairman of the. That's the appropriate um, avenue. Do you think it's going to have an effect? Obviously, the Wallabies are about to start a big campaign on the Western Force players that are currently in the Wallabies, and obviously the other players that are involved in this program. Well, look. Yeah, I mean, part of trying to move on is trying to put this behind us, and and you, you hope. No, I mean, I think the issue though is. Around performance, the injury thing. You know, um, uh, South Africa have e or have exited two teams, um, and uh, and did have a team playing in the super final. So we we've got we also have to be mindful about the fact that our competitors are not standing still in the guy performance. Obviously, the New Zealanders continue to perform strongly, but the South Africans have moved very quickly and actually moved with quite strategic focus to take two teams out and and still have have quite formidable performance from the uh, from the Lions. So, yeah, I, I'd hope that, you know, we, we could put this and this is, this is actually behind us and can now, the teams can focus on the performance. Obviously, we're very, very hopeful that that's the case. Um, but, I, you know, I can't speak to how the team's preparing. That's, that's really something for Michael to, to address. How long would you think Well, look, it's, it's, it's fair to say this is... Um, 
an extremely difficult job. Uh, you know, Bill has, you know, it is, it is of course, um, you know, fashionable to blame Bill for everything that goes wrong in Australian rugby. One of the problems in Australian rugby is that, that we, have, we have an extraordinarily complex governance system with multiple layers of governance um, and Bill doesn't necessarily control all the pieces but I think the advancements that have occurred in the game under Bill's watch are extraordinary in terms of participation in the game. We have junior participation up for the first time in 15 years. We have a very successful sevens program uh, developing. We, you know, there, there's been you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of adjustments. It's a job that requires a lot of resilience. Uh, one of the sad things about rugby is that, that Bill uh, rugby just tends to, uh, more than any other sport, tends to turn on its own, and, and this has happened actually to the last few CEOs, is that ultimately a different set of stakeholders uh, don't like don't like various outcomes and and tend to uh, tend to um, you know uh, turn on each other. And that's happened unfortunately for, you know many times. It's a difficult job. Um, the strategic challenges. Uh, are there. A different CEO would not have arrived at a different set of conclusions because the numbers are absolutely clear. Uh, however, having dealt with this issue, Bill, I think, is very generously providing a clear platform for his success that allows the successor to build on the on the, on the the four teams. And, and But it's a difficult job, one that requires resilience and one that Bill's done with extraordinary... Uh, the, you know, the, the thing about Bill is that he has copped an incredible amount of unfair personal criticism and quite, quite um, you know, uh, uh, nasty in cases, but has never shirked from that. I've been with him at games where people have written the most vitriolic, uh, offensive, unfounded and, and uh, factless commentary and the Bill has got right up to them and confronted them very pleasantly and said, look, let's talk about the facts. Uh, so he has always represented the game extremely well uh, and uh, he should be very proud of that and, and the service he's given the game. And, uh, yeah, you know, it will be a, it'll be a challenge to find someone, but I'm sure we'll, um, we'll, we'll that, that search is underway, and we and we very much hope we can find someone, in, uh, in, you know, in the not the distant future. I don't. I I, I I'm not going to uh, give a timeline. Um, yeah, you know, obviously we'll go through. You know, we want to go through a process. It's, it's, it's an important role, and we want to make sure that we get the right person for the job. It's a, look, it's a great privilege being the CEO of Australian Rugby and there'll be a lot of great quality people step up for the role. Thank you. Yeah, no, you, yeah, no I'm happy to yeah, keep going. Adrian, one minute. You're all right? No, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Thank you. Oh.